what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless of course your taste level is lacking and if that's the case baby that's a you problem i can't help you okay before we get started i want to i want to show off my little hat i have decided and i know some of y'all who follow me on instagram saw that i posted it on my story already but i decided to lock my hair and i loved it i'm loving the process it's a lengthy journey but child i'm enjoying every day of it now i do get a little insecure job because i be feeling like the girls don't know i'm beginning a lock journey girl and it just kind of sometimes gives i haven't combed my hair in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks um which is also true but girl for a reason mother is locking her hair and i love it i'm always on a hair journey with y'all y'all remember when i shaved my head bald and then i went through the growth journey of growing it back girl and now we have decided to lock it so yeah Mama got baby locks. Really quick update on Bella Marie. We are still struggling, but she is definitely getting better. The issues between her and Blue have appeared to completely um, dissolve at this point. I still have not had any like altercations between the two. But like I mentioned in the last video, Blue has set his boundaries, made them very clear, and their belly is snoring in the background. Y'all see my nails? They're so cute. That is pretty much all of the updates that I have for you guys. I'm feeling better. Am I feeling my best? No, but you know progress grateful for that all good updates and without further ado let's get into today's video because i feel like i'm just rambling girl mouth dry and all of that so as we all know this guy is a sad strange sick little man and his story has been retold more times than that of adam and eve child so i'm not here to give yet another rundown of Jeffrey Dahmer's life. Instead, today we are focusing on Christopher J. Scarver, who took out Jeffrey Dahmer vigilante style. Today we're going to get into his story, how he landed himself in prison to begin with, and the things that transpired after, because it's a very interesting story. I will say that I have not watched Dahmer. I have no plans of watching Dahmer. Um, it's no shade. I just am not interested. I'm already not even a TV girl to begin with and I'm just child. I'm so sick of hearing this man's name honestly. I also want to throw out there the reminder that I know some people have watched Dahmer and I know in particular the order in which they described the gym incident happening is not the order happening in real life. So yes, yeah, some things are going to be different because I'm going off of court documents not a TV script. Christopher J. Scarver was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on July 6th of 1969, making him a cancer, a cancer like Bella Child. At that point, I already knew that this was about to be some madness, okay? No shade to the cancer. Love y'all. He is born the second of five children in a family that does not have a whole lot. Their resources are very limited. And his childhood is reportedly very troubled. He is acting out a lot in school and ultimately drops out his junior year of high school. Now, whether or not he began drinking while he was in high school or if he picked up this nasty little habit after he dropped out is unclear. But after he leaves high school, he definitely falls down the rabbit hole of alcoholism. And around this time, he begins hearing voices, which is not. Not that good of a combination, I don't think. He would have episodes that were made a lot worse while he was under the influence of alcohol. And this very quickly becomes too much for his mother to deal with. She has five kids to raise and no time for the shenanigans of Christopher. He is not listening to her. He does not want to abide by her rules and the auditory hallucinations she doesn't really understand. Things come to a head between the two of them and she tells him that he has to leave the home. Now this decision of hers is also influenced by the fact that she noticed her other children starting to pick up some of his behavioral issues or habits. Disrespect, not listening to her, things of that nature. So Definitely wanted to remove him before one bad apple becomes five. Now, Chris finds out that his girlfriend is pregnant. So not only is he in a space where he needs to find a means to provide for himself, he got a little baby on the way that he's going to have to buy pampers and diapers for. He attempts to find a job, but him dropping out of high school does not make it all that easy for him. And finishing high school, that is not something that he, he wants to do at this point. Instead, he enrolls himself in the Wisconsin Conservation Corps, like a job prep 
program, which provides training for individuals for certain jobs or trades. And then in the end of the training program, they are typically placed at a place of employment. They're, you know, connected with the job. Now, Christopher thought this was perfect perfect opportunity for him in his situation. And according to him, his supervisor, Edward Pitts, promises him a full-time job upon completion. And he begins training to be a carpenter right away. He wanted to be a little carpenter like Jesus. Now, somewhere along the lines, his supervisor, Edward Pitts, is fired and replaced with Steve Lohman, who does not decide to offer Christopher a permanent job placement once he completes the training. And this does not sit well with Chris. He brings up the point to Steve that Edward had promised him job placement and Steve really is not trying to hear it. He basically is sticking to the fact that job placement is not 100% guaranteed, right? He's made his mind, that's that. Christopher is very annoyed by this, very disappointed, and begins drinking even heavier, which further amplifies these voices that he is hearing in his head. And he really didn't have any more plans beyond this. So it's like, girl, what am I going to do now? And I got this baby brewing. And the voices are probably agreeing and really, you know, adding fuel to the fire and hyping him up. On June 1st of 1990, Christopher Scarver goes into the office of the job site to confront Steve yet again about him not getting this, this job placement. When Steve dismisses Christopher, he pulls out a gun and demands that Steve give him money. Now, Steve does not have much cash on him, but he does give him what he does have, which is just $15. And this pisses Christopher off. In a fit of rage, he shoots Steve once in the head and then turns his attention, jaw and gun, to John Fan, who is the site manager, and demands money from John. When John hesitates to move, he turns his attention back to Steve and shoots him twice more, which completely frightens John even further. And John doesn't have any cash, let alone $15. But he does have a checkbook. So he writes Christopher a check for $3,000 and Christopher flees the site, leaving John unharmed. Now, of course, because he did not attempt to hide his identity or anything like that, it doesn't take police long at all to locate him. And they find him sitting on the steps of his pregnant girlfriend's home. When they approach him, he does not attempt to flee nor evade arrest. He actually tells the respondent officers that he had planned to turn himself in because he knew what he had done was wrong and child at that point that's what he should do. When he's interviewed by a court appointed psychiatrist, he tells them that he doesn't know what came over him that day, that he had never been violent with anyone, had never got into any kind of legal trouble, and that this is not something that he had planned on doing or wanted to do. It was actually the voices in his head that he hears that had instructed him to carry out this act and that he had been hearing these voices for quite a while. It's actually a family that he hears, a woman, a man, a little girl, and a little boy. They had told him to do what he did that day and afterward had assured him that everything would be all right, that this was meant to happen. Everything that is supposed to happen does happen exactly how it's supposed to and that he is God's chosen one. They basically tell him that he is out here doing the Lord's work. He enters a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, and at the end of his trial, he is convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Months later, media headlines erupt with reports of the sick and twisted Milwaukee cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer being sentenced to 15 life terms in prison and him being sent to the same prison as Christopher. Now, most have speculated that Jeffrey Dahmer would not last in prison at all. And if by some slight chance that you are not familiar with the crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer, he took the lives of 17 young black and brown men and then prepped them for consumption. Many of them he did consume. Very sick man. A lot of people did not expect him to make it, honestly, through his first year in prison. And despite the trouble that most people had anticipated Dharma would have, he was having a pretty peaceful stay. But that's because he was kept in solitary confinement away from the general population in a little cell just like this. But after a year in solitary confinement, Dharma becomes 
bored, restless, and a bit more unhinged. He decides that he wants to leave solitary confinement and join general population. He is, of course, advised against joining general population, child. They've been waiting, okay, like sharks in the water. And you have been locked away in the cell to be forever untouched like a Disney princess. Like, it's not a good idea. But to that, he says that he doesn't care what happens to him. Now, prior to joining general population, he had claimed to be a born-again Christian who was prepared to meet the big man upstairs and repent. Okay, he had repented for all of his sins. But his actions once he joins general population say very different. He reportedly taunts the other inmates who already have this deep disdain for him, not only because of his crimes, but because he had been kept away and given special privileges of ensured safety for over a year. He gets a kick out of using his food to replicate severed limbs and body parts. And then he would take little packets of ketchup and use that, like put it on it to make it look all bloody, then eat it. And he thought this was cute and fun and entertaining. And the other inmates did not. One of the other inmates who was there on a 32 year prison sentence decides that he is gonna take matters into his own hands and give Dom a little bit of street justice. For four months, he patiently awaits his opportunity to attack Dom by using this little four inch a uh, shank that he had made out of a toothbrush and a razor blade. And on the morning of July 3rd, 1994, he finally gets this opportunity. During their chapel service, girl, yes, chapel, he lunges at Dahmer and attempts to get him a few good times, but the blade falls off the toothbrush stick, girl, and it just hits the floor. And then prison guards jump in, separate the two, Dahmer walks away with just a couple scratches and he is not at all shaken in his spirit about this attack. He continues with all of his little typical prison shenanigans, irritating and terrorizing the rest of the inmates. Meanwhile, Christopher here, who is well aware that Dahmer has touched down in his prison and is aware of his crimes as well as his shenanigans since he's been imprisoned does not have any direct contact with Dahmer at all. And he pretty much likes it that way. Like he, for the most part, avoids him and pays him no mind. Christopher also has his own issues that he's preoccupied with. The voices of the family that he was hearing before his crime have never left him. The auditory hallucinations have become more intense, so much so that he is known throughout the prison as like this, mentally ill inmate. He is diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic and given psych meds. However, his treatment plan doesn't appear to really be working for him. He is hearing voices almost constantly. On the morning of November 28th, 1994, Christopher is not given the option of avoiding Dahmer when the two of them are assigned to clean the jail's gymnasium along with a third prisoner, Jesse Anderson. Now it's important to know why Jesse here is serving a life sentence. Jesse, born May 3rd, 1957, a good old Taurus, had a very uneventful upbringing. He attends Elmhurst College where he earns a degree in business administration. In 1980, he marries his first wife, Deborah, and the two divorced just four years later. But well, one year after he and Deborah get divorced, he remarries and has three children with his new wife, Barbara. Jesse here is the president of the Lions Club, which to me sounds like an adult version of Boy Scouts. And he does a lot for the community. He is also a regular volunteer at the Divine Word Catholic Church. Now the Andersons appear to be just like any other family, nothing out of the ordinary. The evening of April 21st, 1992 is just like any other date night for Jesse and Barbara Anderson. Or at least it appears to be, right? But toward the end of the night, Jesse makes a frantic 911 call reporting that he and his wife, Barbara, have been ambushed and attacked and are both in need of medical help. Now, Jesse suffers four stab wounds to the chest. And his wife, Barbara, had unfortunately suffered more fatal injuries all to her head and neck. 
Now, when police speak with Jesse about what had transpired that night in the attack, he tells them that he and Barbara were leaving TGI Fridays. They were in the parking lot when two black men had approached Barbara and attacked her. Now, he, of course, being her husband and protector, intervenes, tries to tussle with the men, and unfortunately is hit four times in the chest. He also hands over a L.A. Clippers baseball cap that he had managed to knock off of one of the men during their struggle. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to get like a really clear view of the assailants. All he could see and all he knew was that they were black men. But when details of this attack and crime hit the media, a college student comes forward and tells police that Jesse... Mr. Anderson here had purchased that same hat from him just a few days before the attack happened. And according to an employee of a military surplus store, the red-handled weapon that had been retrieved from the crime scene and used by these two black men was purchased just two weeks prior by Jesse Anderson. And this store is actually the only store in the state that sells this particular knife. And as they're zeroing in on Jesse and seeing what he's been up to the last couple of weeks, they find that just a month prior to the attack, he had reached out to the life insurance company or Barbara's policy to make sure that the policy was still being paid and still very much valid. This policy was $250,000. All of this comes together really quickly and just eight days after he had been attacked, Jesse is charged and four months later found guilty. TGI Fridays, I beg your fucking pardon. Like if you're trying to get $250,000 off of me in my little life, take me somewhere better than TGI Fridays. How you gonna make that be my last meal? And it's no shade to TGI Fridays, but if I'm going out, baby, make it nice. Jesse receives life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 60 years. And it turns out that this would only make two of those 60. Because a white man who took the life of his wife for an insurance policy and claimed that two black men had done it. The deranged degenerate that is Jeffrey Dahmer, who's taken the lives and eaten the bodies of several black men paired with this young black man who is hanging on to his sanity by two strands of frog hair put together to work is a recipe for disaster not to mention jesse had defaced this painting of martin luther king that another prisoner had done he had gone behind him and painted like a bullet wound on the head I thought that was cute and funny and so Christopher had actually witnessed this and did not think it was cute nor funny and now we have all three of these men assigned the same work study and then the guards that are assigned to watch them decide to leave them alone unsupervised Christopher goes to get started he gets a mop bucket to fill with water and as he is doing so he feels one of the other two inmates tap him on his back, like poke him. When he turns around, they're both there and they both giggle and he has no idea which one had done it, nor does he appreciate the gesture or the laughing. Dahmer and Jesse then both separate to go do their tasks. Christopher picks up a 20 inch metal bar from the gym equipment and follows Jeffrey Dahmer into the gym bathroom. He confronts Dahmer and addresses not only the little poking laugh, but also his crimes. He expresses his disdain for Dahmer, tells him he is disgusting. Now, while Christopher is talking to Dahmer, he notices Dahmer is glancing over at the door as if he's plotting his escape. At this point, Christopher walks towards him, begins to corner him, making it very clear that baby you're not about to run out of here. Then 25 year old Christopher Scarver takes the 20 inch metal bar and bludgeons 34 year old Jeffrey Dahmer, leaving him clinging to life right there on the floor. At no point does Dahmer attempt to fight back or block or anything. So apparently he really was okay with how things turned out once he went into general population. Afterward, Christopher turns his attention to Jesse who is not inside of the bathroom slash locker room. He's still out into the gym area cleaning. Using the same metal bar, he approaches Jesse 
and does the same to him. It's them sending these three in there to clean up and them making a bigger mess for me. After attacking the two men, Christopher very calmly returns to his cell. And when one of the guards near his cell asks him, like, what is he doing home early from work? Like, why are you not still working? He responds, God told me to do it. You will hear about it on the six o'clock news. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Dahmer is found still barely holding on, but... He dies on the way to the hospital and Jesse Anderson succumbs to his injuries two days later. And for these offenses, Christopher Scarver receives an additional two life sentences in prison. Now, Christopher actually received a lot of praise for acting as like a vigilante, taking out these two guys, uh, one of which, of course, had a roster of black men as his victims to other creating two phantom black men to blame his heinous crime for. But Christopher maintains that although he has disdain for both of them or had disdain for both of them, he never intended to confront either of them, attack either of them, and that he instead suffered from a psychotic break in that moment and wasn't, wasn't even thinking about exacting revenge. It is also Christopher's belief and mind you that the guards left them alone on purpose, hoping that Christopher would do what he had done. Either way, he peacefully accepted his additional life terms, or at least he tried to do so peacefully. In 2005, Christopher Scarver files a civil rights lawsuit against prison officials citing the conditions he'd suffered since that day in the gym. Because although those particular guards might have set him up for the okie doke and wanted Jeffrey Dahmer out of here. Not everyone shared in this disdain for Dahmer. Some of the guards actually, I wouldn't say liked him, but did not have an issue with it. They took more of an issue with what Chris had done as opposed to Jeffrey Dahmer and what he had done. Some of the guards and prison officials did not feel like two additional life sentences were enough. Christopher spent 16 months in solitary confinement, which according to court documents significantly aggravated his mental illness. Now the prison claims that he was treated in such a way because he was schizophrenic, he was delusional, dangerous, and unmanageable. But the next prison that he was transferred to finds him to be none of these things. Now he is schizophrenic, but they didn't find him to be unmanageable or disorderly or dangerous. According to the second prison, he was to their surprise, very well behaved. And they gave him these audio tapes to help quiet the voices in his head, which helped significantly. And he was even allowed to mingle with the other inmates without causing any kind of friction or incident. But unfortunately, five years into his stay at this particular prison, he is sent back to his original super max prison, where even psychiatrists have advised that the conditions at the Supermax facility are so severe and restrictive that they exacerbate the symptoms that mentally ill inmates exhibit. And at the Supermax prison, they have a system, right? So on level one, you spend 30 days locked in a windowless single person cell. And you're in this tiny cell for all but four hours a week. The inmates are allowed four hours of recreation outside of their cell, but it's in another room that is the exact same size as the cell, like this small windowless room that is not much better. The lights are on for 24 hours inside of the cell for these 30 days, literally every day, so that the inmate is visible to prison staff at all times. There's no AC for the cells. They become extremely hot in the summertime, sending the heat index inside of the cell well over 100 degrees on a lot of days. And even on the cooler days, it is said that the cells rarely go below 90 degrees. Like that's on a cool day. They cannot have anything electronic. They cannot even have a little watch, just a Bible, legal documents, and up to 25 personal letters. Now, if you behave during these first 30 days, like literally no infractions, not even a little smart mouth. You are then promoted to level two and given a few more privileges and slightly better conditions, but not much better. Like you might get lights out at this point and a few more hours in the recreation room. But other than that, you won't have to behave for another 30 days to get to level three. Mentally ill patients rarely make it to level two and spend most of their time 
at level one. The heat was said to negatively impact Christopher's antipsychotics. And according to the legal document that I am sourcing and referencing, uh, because mother is not a medical professional, I've been plenty of things in my day, but that is not one. Antipsychotics, at least the ones that he was taking, already put a person at risk for heat stroke, dangerously low blood pressure, and a heat-related disease called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The constant lighting is also not ideal for someone who takes these medications. And without his audio tapes to quiet the noise, Christopher is spiraling. And his mental illness okay things are going from bad to worse very quickly he attempts to advocate for himself and express his concerns health concerns to the prison staff but they don't care child so he decides to stop taking the antipsychotics because they were making him so much worse during the summer months but of course him not being on the antipsychotics also makes his condition a lot worse so he decides that you know at this point I'm sick of all of the things he takes his little chunk of antipsychotics and takes them all at once and attempts to just say goodbye cruel world and check out when that does not work he attempts to aggressively bang his head on the cell wall repeatedly he would do this very often for long periods of time and told a prison psychiatrist that he wanted to break his head open so that the voices could escape one time he actually goes into his head with a razor so that he could cut whoever or whatever was talking and moving around inside of his head out. Now granted there is and was at the time a lot of research done that details how these conditions are not ideal for someone with a severe mental illness such as this guy. It is still decided that Christopher Scarver had failed to cite evidence that prison guards knew this information and knew these conditions were making him worse. So he does not win the civil suit. However, it does shed light on his situation and puts the end to those conditions for him. He then undergoes extensive psychiatric treatment that over time reels him back in a little bit, at least enough to function. In 2015, he even wrote and published his first collection of poetry and has since published several other books of poetry let me read y'all a poem by him this is the, the the first poem that was in the book i did not handpick it it's called the penetrator and it goes a little something like this with the tenacity of a sperm cell i am coming at you so close your legs and guard your eggs because you know what we do and that's called the penetrator so if you want to check it out if you want to hear more from him read more from him um everything is on amazon that's your kind of poetry. Today, Christopher Scarver has connected with his adult son, Christopher Scarver Jr., who was born right before he was imprisoned. The father and son were estranged for a while, but now maintain a relationship through like exchanging letters, maybe poetry, you know, phone calls and visits. And yeah, that is pretty much the life and story of Christopher J. Scarver. Some people see him as a hero. Some people do not. I personally would have voted for sales suffering for Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer, but child, oh well. And that is it for today's video. My mother has just recently moved to Houston. Yay. I'm about to go visit her. Um, get this, of course, edited and uploaded for you guys. And yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Don't forget to like this video, share with a friend, subscribe if you have not. As always, I genuinely appreciate you spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. Oh my God, they both snoring now. Like my goodness, it's the tag team for me. Like they are literally cuddled up snoring together. It's a lot. I've been talking for 10 minutes and I ain't saying much in there. Christopher J. Scarver was born in, I was about to say Wilcock, Milwaukee, now Wilcock. He is acting out. On June 1st of 1990, Christopher Starver, Starver, who was that? Who was that girl? He asked, uh, enraged, he shoots. Now, of course, because he did not attempt to like hide his identity or blah, 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 blah. Cannibal that is John, no. I was thinking Hannibal Lecter said John and Jeffrey was supposed to come out. Oh my goodness. The cannibal, Hannibal Lecter. No, not Hannibal Lecter. What am I talking about? And was, was Hannibal even from Milwaukee? Was he even from the US? Year in solitary. Okay. But his actions once he joined solitary, not solitary, goodness. For four months, he patiently awaits for his opportunity. 
irritating all of the girls, irritating and terrorizing the rest of the inmates. But well, one year after he and Deborah get divorced, divorced, what? And has two children. No, he has three. What am I talking about? Now, the Andersons appear to be just like any other American family, just, you know, scratching and surviving. Christopher is, what's the word? He then undergoes extensive psychiatric treatment that puts him, okay, he then goes, I personally would have voted for self-suffering for Mr. Jill, Jill Dahmer, what? 